وبذلك من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له. واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله. اما بعد
Also, your sister must come out with your wife as a partner. All of those behaviors of Islam, the khulaq, or the, the manners that you're supposed to have as a, as a, as a Muslim, all of them also apply to your wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sima ma muhiruna ikhwa. Apparently the, the believers are but a single brotherhood. And this means, it doesn't mean just among the brothers, it means among the brothers and the sisters or the, the male and the female of the community, that they are supposed to live as a, uh, as a brotherhood. You'll find, for example, some brothers, who when they go to the mosque or when they deal with other brothers, they are, they are the best Muslims. They are applying all of the principles of, of Islam. They do not backbite their brothers, they do not cheat their brothers, they do not harm their brothers. If their brothers are in any need, they will do their best to help them and so on. But when it comes to dealing with their wives, you'll find completely different behaviors. As if these laws of Islam are meant to be towards their brothers in Islam, but are not meant or are supposed to be applied towards their sisters who are their, who are their wives, uh, who have to be their wives. But actually, as I said, all of those rights and obligations that, that a Muslim has towards his brother, or a Muslim has towards his sister, she has towards her husband, and the Muslim brother has towards, towards his wife. So he is supposed to treat her kindly, he is supposed to not uh, harm her, to the best of his ability, he is supposed to not lie to her, he is supposed to not cheat her, he is supposed to not uh, backbite her, and so forth. But beyond those rights, also with respect to the uh, with respect to the uh, husband and wife, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beyond those rights that are basic to the brotherhood of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown us clearly in the Quran that, that there should be even more of a close relationship between the husband and wife. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points this out as one of his signs. وَمِنْ عَيَاتِهَا خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَادِ لِسْتَكْتِنُ وَجَئِهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مُوَدِّزًا وَرَحْمًا that one of the signs is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created mates for us from our own uh, from our own soul in order for us to have calmness and tranquility and happiness with with among them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues by saying and he has put love and mercy between them. So besides the Muslim, for example, since I'm dealing with both uh, men and women here at the same time, some of my sentences might come on screen. Anything I say towards the men applies equally towards, towards the women. So what that means, for example, is that not only that if a Muslim has a wife, but that's his sister in Islam, and he has to deal with their property according to the principles of Islam, but this verse the Quran is telling us that in fact the Muslim has is showing us that the relationship between the man and his wife in Islam should be even beyond the basic principles of brotherhood that he finds among, among the other brothers. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the signs that he has created a special kind of bond between the husband and wife in which, the, uh, in which each spouse, each spouse finds uh, comfort in the other and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made between them love and mercy. So beyond, so when, uh, when we talk about husbands, husband's rights and uh, wife's rights and so forth. In fact, we have to go through all of the, the rights of Islam that someone has upon his brother and so forth. But, of course, that would take up all the time we have, so we're not going to, uh, going to do that. There will be another topic about the Pura, or the behavior that a Muslim is supposed to have, and that behavior, as I said, should be towards her, uh, or towards his, his wife or well, many hadiths of the, of the Prophet Muhammad show us how important is the behavior towards one's wife. And inshallah, at the end, we'll also discuss one hadith of the Prophet if I remember, that uh, show how important is the, the, the proper relationship or the proper behavior of a wife towards uh, her husband. And that's the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad in which he said, خيركم خيركم لأهل that the best of you is the one who is best to his wife. The best of you is the one who is best to his wife. And what that means, actually, is that the sign of a Muslim being a good Muslim and the best Muslim, one of the signs is how he treats his wife. 
one of the times is how he treats his American partner who he spends a great deal of time with and who is his close relationship. If a person wants to look at himself, if a Muslim man wants to look at himself and wants to ask himself how good really of a Muslim he is, he should ask himself and look to see how he treats his wife. Because the Bible says that it says the best of you is the best to his wife. Well, this hadith of the Prophet perhaps it should be stressed more than, uh, than it is stressed sometimes because as I said, we have this problem where brothers will treat other brothers in the best way and then they will treat their sisters in Islam who are their wives in one of the worst ways. And this is the fact almost, well, I can't say the, the opposite of how it should be, but it shows, it's a reflection of the fact that the person, that brother, doesn't really understand uh, Islam completely and doesn't understand his rights and his responsibilities uh, within the Muslim family. The best of you is the best of his wife. And the Prophet said that he is the best of his wife. So if you want to see also how we should treat our wives and we should look to the example of the, uh, the Prophet on the well, One important principle, this is by the way still all introductory. Uh, I'm going to think that we're supposed to do You're supposed to be the chaperone here so it doesn't do much better you're supposed to one, one last uh, important principle before we uh, kind of get into an area where there's uh, might be room for some discussion, more of a workshop type of uh, discussion. Is it, is it one principle is clear from the from the Quran, from the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad said them, and that is that in the Muslim household, the uh, it says the job of the man or the responsibility of the man to be the head of the household. There's no uh, it isn't clear from the Quran. I read that from Abu Nuhal Nisa, "Bima nuzzalu ba, nuzzalu Allahu ba'dum ma'al ba, wa bima anku min al-mawlim." That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has that the, uh, that the men, that the men are in a position of authority over uh, over women. And also on this uh, on this verse, I would like to make some uh, some comments. I know that some of the brothers who are here were also in uh, the camp recently in Toledo, uh, Ohio, where I made some of these comments. Maybe that's why you're speaking to you. <laughs> This verse also should be understood, uh, should be understood properly, and how it is to be applied uh, should be understood properly, in particular by the men. Some people take this, some brothers, I've seen many brothers, take this as, take this verse of meaning that the husband is the boss and whatever he says uh, must go. And they consider when they talk about the rights of the husband, usually they will, uh, they will read this verse. Yeah? That this is the right of the husband that he is in a position of authority over the women. Well, some scholars, when discussing this verse, and this goes back even to some of the some of the early scholars, they said that this verse should not be looked at as a verse necessarily discussing the rights of the husband, but it should be looked at as a verse discussing the obligation of the husband that it is his obligation to be the head of the household and therefore he is responsible for the decisions that he makes for the household. He is responsible to make sure that the decisions that he makes for the household are, are in the best interest of the household, both in both this world and in the earth. That is his responsibility. The same, the same thing as, for example, as Khalifa, the, the Khalifa or the leader of the Islamic State or the Emir of the mosque. I mean, these are positions of, of authority. If you've ever been the emir of the mosque, you'll know that it's more of an obligation than it is a right. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting, putting men in the household in a position of authority, and they will be asked about their position and their responsibility, and they should take it, look at it more as a, as a position of obligation, not a situation where they have strong rights and they are, they are the head of the household. They have to make sure that every decision that they make for the household, they have to do their best to make sure that every decision they make is in the best interest of their family, of their wives and children and so forth. And they should also, they also have to realize that they're not, 
the same way that the Khalifa is not a ruler who simply rules without looking to the needs of the people, but they also have to realize that they have to look, see what is the needs of the wife and children. They have to consult with them, make sure with them, and then, and then after doing that and, and, and trying to find the best decision, the best action, uh, and all of them have a site, then they make the decision and they follow up their decision. When they make their decision, then they are supposed to be followed by the, the members of the family, and this is their situation, this is their position of being the head of, of the household. So they, they should realize this obligation, do their best to make the best decisions for the family, but then when they, when they make a the decision, then it is an obligation upon the, uh, the members of the family to accept that decision and to follow it. And if the wife, for example, disagrees with it, when I say disagrees, I don't mean from the, from the Sharia point of view, but she feels that uh, something else might have been, been better, for example, with respect to this dunya. Even if she disagrees with it, she must do her best to follow her husband. As that is this condition that once you make the decision, that uh, the decision has to be followed up and the members of the family uh, have to obey this, this final decision. So those are some introductory points that I just wanted to get uh, out of the way or that were on my mind for, for today's lecture. That, that the relationship between the husband and wife or from the general Islamic teaching that we have to do our best to look to the Quran Sunnah and make sure that we are applying Quran Sunnah when it comes to the relationship between husband and wife. And that all of the rights that any other brother or any other sister would have upon us, our wife or our husband also have upon us, all of those rights. But the situation is even greater with respect to our spouse because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has pointed out the relationship between spouses are one of the, one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and its creation, and finally, it is the situation where the, uh, the, the man is, is the, is the, has the dominant position in the household. This is a position of obligation, uh, a position of authority in which he should fear all this and what God is concerning that position. But at the same time, once he has made a decision in the proper way, it is the obligation of the members of the household to, uh, to follow him and, and obey him in that, uh, that decision. Well, I don't know if on that introductory point there's any uh, question or comments that you might have. If there's, I will open the floor now for any question or comments. If you, if you ask about something that we will discuss later, then I will simply tell you if we will discuss it later. So is there any question or comments? Just feel free to speak. Uh, not all at once, but... No, should I tell there's no question from? Yeah. And the brothers, I guess you can fax your comments. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but now let's get to more, more specifically the uh, the rights, the rights of the wife within the uh, within the Islamic marriage. Now, as I pointed out. We're not talking now about the, uh, the general rights that the, that the woman has upon her husband as a, as a sister in Islam, but now we're talking about those specific rights that the, uh, that the, that the, that the Muslim wife has upon her husband. So these are both, I guess you could say, the, uh, the rights of the husband, uh, of the wife, and the obligation of the husband. Well, since uh, we're going to give this talk first to the women, according to the original schedule, we'll start with the rights of the wives before we get to their, uh, before we get to their obligations. One of the different books of this, this topic is discussed, uh, and the older books is discussed throughout the books in different places. One of the, one scholar who did a good job of putting the different rights uh, together, and I will basically be following his, uh, the pattern that he followed was uh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad al Rizari, who discussed, he discussed basically 12 rights of the, of the wife. Today, inshallah, we'll discuss uh, 13. 
for, well, we'll delete some of the ones that, uh, that, he, uh, that he mentioned in the discussion that he did not mention. The, the first, the first right of the wife is uh, what is known as or to be treated to be treated properly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands commands the believers in the Quran to treat their wives properly. To treat your wife bin Aru. What's the meaning of the of bin Aru? Which you the only man here, you'll be all the questions will be directed to you. <laughs> The <laughs> Maro in general means that which is good, uh, that which is known in society, known by the individuals to be something good. But what it means here in this verse in particular is that the, uh, the Muslim uh, husband. As I said, has an even further obligation towards his wife to treat her in a kind and, and good manner. Now, the exact, the exact um, uh, limits of ma'roof, the exact limits of how the husband is supposed to treat the, the wife, this will be de de determined according to environment and custom. In other words, there's no hadith, there's no verse in the Quran that says, for example, how much time during the day the husband should spend with his wife and what kind of activities they should do together and so forth. This will be based on the environment and, and custom. For example, here in this environment, uh, in most cases, if, if people want to survive financially, they will have to take a job which will require them to work most likely 40 hours a week, if not more. It's not much more. Well, what this means, for example, with respect to the wife, is that if the husband is working 40 hours a week, it would be, it would be beyond the rights of the wife. Uh, it would not be unfair for the wife to ask the husband, for example, to spend also those 40 hours a day with him. And this would be beyond the uh, al This would be beyond actually what is the, the right of the wife. And also because of our situation here, going to the mosque, for example, we don't have a mosque at every corner here. The Muslim the husband may have to spend more time going to the mosque and so forth. It would be again beyond the uh, the limits of ma'roof to for the uh, for the wife to to ask her husband, for example, not to attend the mosque. It takes just twenty minutes or half an hour to go to the mosque uh, back and forth from home and so forth. So the exact limits of uh, ma'roof, as I said, they are determined by uh, custom and environment. How exactly the the, the wife is the wife supposed is supposed to be treated by the uh, by the Muslim by the Muslim husband? At this point, it is kind of open. But the thing is that the Ma'ruf means that those those rights that the wife that the wives have in general throughout the Muslim society and the way that they're treated in general, each Muslim husband is obliged to do his best to make sure that his wife gets the same and similar rights that other uh, wives in society have. Well, look, man, uh, the Prophet comes to and expressing this point about how to, uh, the, the Muslim should do his best to treat his wife in the, the best manner. I already mentioned what Hadith and what she said, that, uh, and the best of you is one of the best of wives, but also uh, this, just before the Prophet was, was to die, the Prophet also uh, reminded us about our treatment of wives and that we have to treat them well. He said, uh, Allah, Allah, he, he mentioned the word, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Allah, Allah, concerning your women, in other words, be aware of Allah concerning women, that they have been taken, you have been taken, you have taken them in your, in your custody by a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have to do your best to treat the Prophet. Now with respect to this point also, there's a hadith of the Prophet which is uh, sometimes uh, misunderstood, and that's the hadith of the Prophet in which he said that the women were uh, created from a crooked rib, 
and if you try to straighten them, you will break them. What's the meaning of this anyway? Uh, the meaning of the Tajik is that uh, women uh, or have a nature that is just a document that a man should not abuse his authority over them and uh, think it should be screened in doing so that he has a possibility of really pushing her outside of the room by abusing his rights. Is this correct? Right? Inshallah. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's your interpretation of it. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't have been given it, except that was just uh, a that I mentioned not uh, over, over two times. Basically, what the Hadith what the is referring to is that when, when a man uh, gets into a marital situation, that he is marrying, first of all, uh, a woman or a female who the nature in general of females is different from the nature of men. There's difference in their behavior, there's difference in their characteristics in general. And then if the Muslim man tries to force their, her, her, his wife to be completely the way that he wants, to be completely the way that he wants her to be, then what he will do the meaning of breaking the rib here actually most scholars they, they define it as uh, not driving the woman from the team, but forcing her into a situation that they will get divorced. So what it means, the most I said I'm is that when you when you get the wife, there's going to be some characteristics perhaps in the wife that are not consistent with the with the husband's characteristics. The husband should realize that from the time even before he gets before he gets married. And she should accept some of these characteristics in the wife which are different from him, from him because if he tries uh, to change the wife too much, it will lead to, most likely, to, uh, to divorce and, and uh, uh, for the marriage. So the, the first right, as I said, is kind of, a, kind of an elastic or flexible right. It's based on system and, and environment. This is the, uh, the right of uh, being treated uh, the second right is a little bit, a little bit beyond that, and that is the right the the uh, the Muslim wife has the right to exactly. I don't know exactly how to uh, how to translate that, but. What that means basically is that when the Muslim, uh, when the Muslim man is, among, uh, is with his wife, it is his responsibility or his, his duty to try to do things that will make his wife uh, happy. What I mean by happy is, is in this sense is that he should not be serious all the time. He should not have a kind of nature where the wife gets no joy out of him. This, as soon as he comes in, as soon as he comes home, he is either in a serious mood, he never, he's never playful with his wife. So the Sunnah of the Prophet Hamza said that when he used to be with his wife alone, he used to be, uh, he used to be uh, joyful or playful with them according to their nature. Now some of his wives are more mature, so he was less, less so with them, and some of his wives were younger, like Aisha, and therefore he used to be more playful with, uh, with her. But the point is that it is the Sunnah of the Prophet and some scholars included as one of the rights of the wife that the, uh, that the, 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 the Muslim husband should try to bring some joy into his, uh, into his wife's uh, life by uh, uh, doing things with her that perhaps he wouldn't do with his brothers for example. Uh, going beyond the the, uh, the characteristics that you might have in public to play with his wife and support with her in such a way that she will enjoy uh, and get some enjoyment uh, from the marriage. But also related to that is the third the third right is considered the right of the of the, of the wife, and this is the what the Gazali calls a yes. So the yes, as probably you're familiar with, this is a term used for uh, politics. And what he means by that is that uh, at the same time that he is supposed to be 
three sources of life in such a way that he makes her happy and so on. At the same time, though, he's, he's supposed to make sure that she is following uh, Islamic behavior properly. So he, he's not just, for example, there to have fun with his wife and make her happy and so forth. At the same time, though, he has the obligation, and this is considered a right of the, of the wife, to make sure that she is behaving in a proper manner. Well, the evidence for that is all of the verses in the Quran, for example, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to order good and eradicate evil. And the ordering of good and eradicating evil is, is first and foremost of, uh, an obligation upon you towards those people you have most power and most control over. So in the household, the husband has uh, most control over uh, his wife, and it is his obligation to, to, um, uh, to make sure that she is doing what is proper and so on. Now I said I said that this will not be election, it's supposed to be uh 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 a work uh, work uh work yeah, and these people are not working yet, so <laughs> so, so far now I've discussed the uh, three uh, three points, three of the rights uh, of, of being treated in Nauru for and also the Jaiva and also the Fiat. So the three of the eleven or ten or twelve, whatever we might uh, we might discuss. Are there any comments or questions about these three that we've discussed so far? I hope there's some comments. Otherwise, I don't know. Now, you're, you're representing the men, so anything that you can imagine that any of the brothers there might have in their mind, you should bring it. Any, any comments, questions? Yeah, one question. Special delivery comments. Yeah. This is a much more peaceful group so far than some of the communities like I think. You mentioned that the third right was the right to be uh, uh, political. It's a political right. Yeah, it's a political right. It's a political right. It's a political right. It's a political right. And make sure that your wife is practicing the clock. What do you. Uh, how about in the case of a wife is not Muslim? And in the case where your wife is not Muslim, you don't have the right to, to force her to do those uh, activities which are specifically for Muslim women, obviously. But at the same time, you have the, you have the right to, uh, to enforce her, or you have the right over her that she gives you the same rights that are common among the people in society, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. But obviously you cannot, for example, if you do not have, if, you're, if your wife is not Muslim, and you're not living in a Muslim society, you do not have the right, for example, to force her to wear hijab. And you, you, don't, you don't have that right. But you have the right to force her to dress decently in the manner that uh, a woman or a wife is supposed to behave in society, but unfortunately, of course, the sightings are changing, as the, uh, the, brother was, the brother was describing to me in uh, Philadelphia on the way over here. Uh, fortunately, uh, out west, we're a little bit behind. We haven't gotten to some of the points that you mentioned. <laughs> in a situation like this, in a society like this, and I think this might be one of the main arguments. Well, actually, maybe that's what we should discuss first. Is it allowed for a Muslim man to marry an honest woman? <laughs> That's the point. But yeah, for whatever the Quran does, allow for Muslim man to marry to amongst the people of the book. The the brother gave the standard answer. On the Quran, it seems that the that the it is allowed for Muslim men to marry from the people of the book. Now, if we wanted to get into another lecture about principles of the seed and how to interpret the Quran, uh, one of the principles of the seed is that the, the statements of the Sahaba, how the Sahaba interpret the Quran is considered hujja, proof of many matters, or an authority of many matters. And you'll find that among the Sahaba, the way they interpreted this verse is that it's not talking about the uh, non Muslim women in general the Jewish and Christian women in general. It is talking specifically about Ahla Zimma. Ahla Zimma. What was Ahla Zimma? 
that by itself will not be will not be sufficient. Can I comment for more? Sure. Okay. Sure. If the situation is possibly there, for example, um, in regards to the together, you have some it's dependent yeah. on the um, what the last year or what the man is, this particular person there may not get the information from us. They may not consider the complete covering as being an obligation upon the system. You have some, some individuals consider themselves Muslims that indulge in the listening and the playing of music, music of music and musical instruments. You have some that um, look at um, situations where you have to listen. You know, you know, some the situation, they don't necessarily consider that brothers should be in one area, sisters should be in another area. And suppose the husband is more than pretending a master that will uh, permit these things, where the wife, I mean, not the wife, the ex-wife is in a situation that um, draws distinction um, when it comes to the, the mixing and the covering and the um, keeping away from music and those types of things. It's my turn now. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a good, uh, a good question. I'm trying to think of how to phrase it quickly for, for the brothers. The sister's asking about a situation where, for example, the, the ex-wife attends the mosque. So does that more uh, strict than applying uh, Islam, for example, with respect to hijab and not listening to music and not mixing between men and women? And the husband is attending a mosque where all these things are allowed. Now, are, when, you, when you say the husband is attending a mosque like that, do you mean that the husband agrees with those things, or he just happens to be in a situation where he, he attends those mosques? In so many ways, he agrees because he also participates in situations like that, away from the mosque. Uh, if it is a situation where an action is, uh, is just clearly a disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what we mean by that is that there's some action. And would, someone could argue, someone could argue that there's a different opinion about it. And I'm sure you've all heard that argument. <laughs> that there's a different opinion about certain things. For example, let's say mixing between men and women. Some people argue, and there's, there's a lot of speakers that travel throughout the United States that say there's not really much harm in it, and so forth and so forth and so on. If the ruling is something that has a very weak evidence, that is clear from the Sharia that, that that opinion has a very weak evidence and is in general rejected by the Fuqa'a, by the jurors, then that action is still considered uh, unacceptable. So there's, there's, we have to, in other words, what I'm saying is we have to distinguish between two, two types of actions, two types of uh, differences. One is where the husband, for example, might be following one thing and the wife is following something else. And both, both of those actions have strong evidence for them. One is stronger than the other, for sure. There's no question about that. In the Sharia, everything will be one stronger than the other. And the one who is a real scholar will be able to distinguish without any doubt that this is correct and the other one is wrong. But there, if there's a situation where there's two opinions, the wife is following one and the husband is following the other. So both of them have some strong evidence for it. In other words, the evidence for it has some basis in the Sharia. In that case, neither action should be considered physical or should be considered uh, an outright disobedience to, to all of them. Like that. As opposed to a situation where the husband and wife are following different opinions, and one has a strong evidence for it, and the other has an evidence which is unacceptable by the Sharia, it is not a strong evidence or it's completely dominated by the evidence of the other point of view. In this case, there's no excuse for following the weak opinion. In this case, there's no excuse for following the weak opinion, and the one who follows that weak opinion would still, can still be considered an Islam to all of that. For example, if you study the history of the you will find many weak opinions given by every item that they said has some slip uh, up or some mistake. And as uh, some of the scholars said, if you follow the mistakes of the Rama, he will almost be outside of Islam. And he will be taking riba based on some uh, some uh, kufa. He will be drinking a beer, which is actually alcohol drink, based on some fatwa from Iran. He will be making his own based on some fatwa from Malaysia uh, from and so forth. If you follow all these mistaken opinions, he will be actually more than fatwa, he will be almost outside of Islam. 
So the situation is, is where there's no really strong basis for that opinion, then that opinion is to be rejected and the one who follows it can still be considered as committing good. And probably a lot of I would say that for example with respect to music. To take music three examples, let's take the example of music. There's there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever for the permissibility of music. And if you want to go in even more detail, if you want to talk about what what is the wife in the non practicing Muslima, but she still retained the right to custody of the children, especially if she is the only Muslim in her family? Uh, yeah, she's a non practicing Muslim. What, what, what do you mean by non practicing? Well, I'm just, you know, uh, but you know, what is, you know what I'm saying? If she's not practicing Islam, do the children still go to her, even though she's the only Muslim in her family? Okay. I'm just saying. It depends on what you mean by it. Not as we will discuss in the last lecture, either today or tomorrow, depending on what the other brothers will make it. When you say not practicing, you might be, you might be just out of it now. Not if not, 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 well, this is, as I said, in the same way that the fifth of the husband will be taken into consideration, the fifth of the wife also can be taken into consideration. And the judge can decide in a situation like that that the, uh, that the um, custody of the child should go to the, to the, to the man and, and not the woman. If, if you're not making the lie, okay. So you can leave it for whatever. So what is that going to be funny? For, for the woman, it's supposed to be tonight. Oh, okay. Any other uh, comments, questions? Uh, in as much as that we're not living within a Islamic state at this time, uh, those those things which you mentioned that if a uh, sister is uh, not first, then the uh, brother would be uh, instead of first that of course that the mother might be the child would be rewarded to, to the mother but here uh, how would you uh, make that apply because some people will decide to go to the to the government without the bar as opposed to uh, looking to the laws of the law of the that's one of those questions where it comes up in this, uh, this society the, the way it should be done the proper way it should be done is that the, the local imam, the local uh, Muslims in, uh, in authority. And when I mean by authority, I don't mean just by position, but also by uh, situation of being respected, people of knowledge and so forth. These are the people who should gather together with the husband and the wife and they should decide uh, what should be the proper uh, solution. Now anytime, of course, the, the court here should be avoided because the courts are going to decide in such a way that is not based on Islamic principles. A husband and wife, if they get divorced, they can, they can make any decision. I believe this is also true for Pennsylvania, it's true for the other states that I'm familiar with. They can make any decision among themselves concerning custody and simply uh, uh, go to a lawyer and then file the document that will make that a legal document that both of them have to apply. When we get in, uh, into a situation where, for example, let's say that the man isn't practicing, and and so he's trying to take his child from the from the Muslim uh, mother, for example. Anytime anyone gets in uh, gets into a situation like that, they should try to get uh, a clever lawyer, a clever lawyer, who will argue 
on the basis of the fact that these two, the men and the women, entered the relationship uh, on an Islamic basis. They married according to Islamic law, and they agreed to marry according to Islamic law. And this lawyer, uh, I know this has been successful in other states, again, I'm not familiar with the uh, Pennsylvania, where this lawyer can argue in, uh, in court that the decision that that court will have to abide by the decision according to the Islamic law. And then the judge will bring forth, or ask the, may ask the Muslim to bring forth someone who specializes in Islamic law to make the decision, and that decision will be binding upon both men and women. So any time there's a situation where, for example, one of the spouses, the two, the two, the man and the wife that got married according to Islam, uh, with the idea that they will apply Islam, and then one of them strays from Islam, and somehow the two of them get into court. The other one, the one who's still Muslim, should always try to get a lawyer or uh, present the case in such a way that this is the situation they entered according to Islamic law, and the decision could, should be according to Islamic law. They said it's been successful in other states. I don't know about uh, the state. Yes, yeah, um, now you said something about uh, the brothers can marry non Muslims in a Muslim state. Yes. What about here? This is not a Muslim state. Can Muslim brothers marry the non Muslims here? Yeah, I think, I, as I, as I, I, think I, I think the strongest opinion is that the, uh, with respect to non Muslim women, we are only allowed to marry from that. In other words, we, we are only allowed to marry. Uh, those non Muslims in the Islamic state. We are not allowed to marry the non Muslims, for example, here in the United States. <laughs> okay, let me. Uh, Oh, I'm not sure this is from the men. Uh, I want to get to that later. They, they sound like men's question. <laughs> 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 okay, the next, uh, the next right upon the, upon the wife is, uh, is known as El Liga. What do you mean with El Liga? El Liga? Means, uh, means, uh, means jealousy, but uh, jealousy may not be the best uh, way to, uh, to, to, to translate for uh, Now you know why I don't work as a translator anymore. Um, <laughs> well, what I mean, what, what this concept here is that it is, uh, it is the obligation of the husband to protect the honor of, uh, of his wife in public. And if, anything should, if anyone should say anything about his wife from someone who should protect his honor. And at the same time, he should not respect his wife. The, the, the wife has the right upon her husband that he does not suspect her of evil doing when he has no reason to. Uh, what, uh, the public? The, the brothers from uh, the state of Mississippi have mentioned that uh, Ibn Omar uh, was of the opinion, uh, Abdullah Ibn Omar was of the opinion that it's not allowed for a uh, Muslim man to, to marry a Christian woman. And the reason he said that is because I do not know of any shirk uh, greater than to say that the is the Lord, for, for someone to say that the is the Lord. This is, a, this is a well-known statement from Ibn Omar, but the, uh, the principle here is that whatever Sahaba, whatever Sahabi, whoever the companion of the Prophet is, if this statement goes clearly against any of the texts, whether it is the person of Quran or Hadith, then we do not follow his, his statement. This is Ishtihad from Abdullah Ibn Omar, and this Ishtihad of his uh, is a situation where he is and he tries to be more, more careful. He's not laying down a law for, for the Muslim state, but he is, he is trying to stress the point that these women are committing shirk 
and therefore in his opinion he should be saying that no Muslim man should marry them. In other words, he's more, more than anything else, he's giving advice. But we know clearly that the Quran says that it's allowed uh, to marry those non supporters uh, from the Jews and Christians. And as I said, the strongest opinion of Allah is that it is referring to uh, al Getting back to the, the point that I mentioned about the Aliyah as one of the, uh, one of the rights of the wife, Rose, as I said, that he has to defend her honor, that there's an obligation to defend her honor, and at the same time, he does not have the right to suspect her and to uh, make any statements to her without any cause. As, uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Ba'adhan, that some sense or some speculation and some thoughts about other people are sins. And what, what some of the Sahaba explain this verse is, is, that, is that if you have good thoughts about someone else, it says some thoughts are, are sinful. And they explain that as meaning if you have good thoughts about someone else, it is not sinful. But if you have bad thoughts about someone else, not based on any proof, this is the sin that this is referred to as this person's law. Well, the Prophet Muhammad said in one of his uh, hadiths, recorded by a similarity, he said that the two texts of Alida and two texts of Jealousy, one which is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the other one which is uh, hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one that is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one in which there is um, there is reason to doubt, there is reason to suspect and therefore be jealous or have to consider your honor to be uh, at risk and the one which is hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one where there is no reason to, to suspect anything. But what this means is that some husbands, and they, they are overly suspicious of their wives, and this goes against the, 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 the rights of the wife. And if the wife, if the wife does anything, if she answers the phone, and the husband says, oh, and she says, oh, it's the wrong number, he'll start thinking, he'll start confusing her that maybe. Like this, this kind of thing uh, is unacceptable and it goes against the right, the right of the wife. Is that one clear? Yeah. Any uh, comment about it or question? Like the, the next right is the right of Nabaqa or the right of maintenance, uh, physical or economic maintenance. Well, this maintenance, what it means again is that the, uh, the wife has the right to be sustained economically or materially in a way that is proper for her position uh, in society and for the custom of the society. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us in the Quran neither to be uh, extravagant, to spend too much, nor to tie our hands to our neck where we don't spend anything. And we're supposed to be moderate. We are not uh, any pictures, nor do we spend all the money that we have on a fruitful matter. Well, as I said, the, uh, the right of the wife in this situation, of course, she has to have her basic needs met of housing and shelter and so forth and food. If these are not met, met she has the right to go to a party and the party can uh, put an end to that marriage uh, right away. But beyond the, beyond the basic need, she has the right to be, uh, to be given uh, maintenance, uh, economic, uh, uh, have her economic means met according to the situation, actually according to the situation of her husband. In other words, if she's going to be willing to marry someone, and this brother always is going to marry the poor brother, and she knows that he's poor, that he's poor, then she has the right to maintenance according to how the poor people live in that society. There's not, and, and Islam is about that, and says there's no harm, and the harm is not supposed, the harm is supposed to be avoided. There's no harm supposed to be inflicted by anyone. Obviously, it would be great harm and great hardship that if a poor person marries a woman, and then the uh, woman says, I have the right to maintenance, and I want to be maintained like, uh, uh, 
with the rocks on her. She's always said, we're not, we're not be proper. When the, when the wife enters into the marriage relationship, she knows the capabilities of the husband, and she should be maintained properly uh, according, to the, according to the situation of the husband. So if the husband is poor, let's take a situation where the husband is poor, doesn't have much money, he has some money, a little bit of money, and he is not giving, for example, his wife what is normal even for poor people in this society. Then her rights are not being met. Let's say, like, it is, uh, uh, what would you say, for example, for poor? Of course, poor in Colorado is much different than poor in Philadelphia. I'll grant you that. But, uh, for example, uh, for a poor wife or a wife in a poor family, how many dresses on the average would you say she would have? More. <laughs> what? Okay. So, so uh, uh, her husband just gives her half a dress. This is not me. What do you expect this one? How about pairs of shoes? One or one? One. Let's say they're from a middle class. Okay, okay. Okay, it's both of them. Three dresses. Three dresses. And the husband, the husband has the means to give her three dresses. But for whatever reason, he says, no, I'm only going to give you one. I expect you to be happy with that one. She has the right to complain. Her rights are not being done. Yes? Comments? It, it was a question on even if you're if your sister's uh, used to living this certain way, her husband will buy them for her. But he wanted to take away some because he wanted to get into a community situation. So he's taking away from her. That's still the same, but he's not she's not being met the way she generally is living or customly living. Yeah, yeah, even if he's, if he's entering in the, into a living situation, she does not accept the reduced standard of living. She has the right, I mean, she can ask to be continued, to be maintained at the same standard that she was before. Yeah, let me say this, is this another class? Four people is going and do it anywhere. Is that another lecture? I mean, you know, work yeah, down, work 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 down, I don't think the laws of, of marriage and divorce. Yeah. <laughs> and all, two last points about, uh, about maintenance. Number one, it is completely the responsibility of the husband. Completely the responsibility of the husband. If the wife is forced in a situation where she supplies some uh, financial support to the family, Unless she decides to give that to her husband free of charge, it's considered a law that the husband is supposed to be paid. Yeah. Unless she decides to give it up freely for her husband, it is considered a law that the husband, of course the brother has a common thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have mentioned uh, that this is a forced into situation. Now, uh, when, you, when you say forced into a situation, there's two ways that can be taken. There could be to the step within where a man says, uh, I want you, but you'll get a job, and uh, because, you know, I'm getting sick of paying all the bills. Or it could be to the extent within where, I mean, some, some brothers get like this, okay, I know some brothers are like this. Hey, let me comment on that point. This is completely wrong. To force your wife to work because you can tell her to pay the bills. <laughs> As the brother so eloquently put it here, <laughs> no, that's the children's bill. These are your responsibility. These are your responsibility. The wife has nothing to do with it. She may, she may be responsible for bringing up some of them, but she's not responsible for paying. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at uh, two situations here. One where I know of a situation that now exists where a uh, brother claims that his wife is inconsiderate. Uh, and he's sick of paying the telephone bill, he doesn't want to pay the electric, and he thinks that because of the fact that she's nothing but quote-unquote a leech, that she should go out and get a job and help him uh, with the support. And then we're looking at another situation... I think this brother needs to attend the worship. <laughs> <laughs> the, the wife is under, under absolutely no obligation or responsibility to, to provide even one penny to the family. Now, uh, also another in, in regards to... If he wants to go to a leech, 
say that that wife is a leech. He is making a statement which is so important to take him out of his hand. That is possible. Uh, the, sec the second uh, thing in regards to force, and I suppose that when you say force, that would mean that... Uh, it means anything. Okay, like the brother was like rich in the beginning and say recession came along. <laughs> you know, <laughs> rich. <laughs> <laughs> so as opposed to getting $500 a week, what it used to get now, the brother might get like $150. Yeah, we're in a situation where the brother has faced some hardship and uh, he can no longer pay the bills in order for them to survive. She may be forced to work. Situation is. Unless she gives it with the intent of it being uh, uh, a yeah. Yeah. or a yes, then uh, she's able to keep tabs with the amount of money that she's given them. So I'll pay the rent, I'll pay whatever bills. Uh, and that's, that's for buying food, paying the electric, uh, all of them consider the telephone part of that. And it's a telephone contract. Uh, buying clothes for both her and the children, she's able to keep tabs of all these things. And that uh, even if the marriage comes to an end, that you still be responsible for paying this money back. That's right. So you can put it in the temple loan. It's called the wheat loan. And the book of the Torah the say they define different different types of loan. This is called the wheat loan, but it's the same thing as the loan. She has the right to, to demand that money back. So that's, that's one point. Uh, related to this. Now, the second, the second point is that the, the husband should realize that when he stands on his wife, he's fulfilling his obligation, and the most reward that you would get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the best deeds that we perform are those deeds that we do when we're fulfilling obligations. So whenever we stand on our wives and to sustain them, instead of thinking of them as leeches, we should realize that we are fulfilling our obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the reward will be greater because of that obligation. In fact, the Prophet said that describing different types of dinars, which was the money at that time, uh, uh, the Prophet said that the dinar that you spend in the way of Allah and the dinar that you spend to free a slave and the dinar that you give for a poor person and the dinar that you spend on your family the greatest reward of those different dinars is the one that you spend on your family. Because, as I said, in Islam, the greatest reward we get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for the obligatory deeds. So when we're fulfilling these obligatory deeds and spending on our, our, our wives to sustain them, we are getting the greater reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers up there? Almost all these questions that I've received from the brothers so far uh, have to do with the, uh, the laws of marriage and divorce. So we'll leave them, inshallah, for, uh, for the next uh, workshop and tell the brothers to uh, get better questions here if they want them. <laughs> Related to the topic at hand. So <laughs> <laughs> any question or any question or comments about that, uh, I'm not about. I think it's welcome. And it's based on the verse in the Quran, the man has been put in place to the story. All the women and what the reason for is uh, what they spend uh, out of the world on them. So the next uh, the next obligation of the husband or wife of the wife is a ta'lim. Or to get the uh, it is the obligation of the husband to make sure that his wife has the proper Islamic knowledge. What's the hand of the school and put the full my people now? Save yourself and your family from the hellfire. And it is a place to our Muslim Muslim husband as the head of the household. Again, it's a, it's a position, not just a position of authority, but it's a, 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 a position of responsibility. It's an obligation upon him to make sure that his wife gets the proper Islamic teaching. And as we mentioned in the uh, in that rather long lecture like that, and it's the brother train to was wrong. <laughs> They're all speakers by the time it was finished. <laughs> there are some 
sometimes the doors which are leading away upon the individual. So for example, with respect to the Muslim woman, and we, and we talked about that night that for different people. I didn't do that all or whatever. Different towns. Uh, depending on the situation of the person, some, uh, some knowledge might be obligatory upon that person. With respect to, for example, the Muslim woman, she has to know how to pray. There's an obligation, an obligation upon her to know how to pray, and there's an obligation upon the, uh, the Muslim man, the Muslim husband, to make sure that his wife knows how to pray. Me, okay, it's fine. <laughs> but it just sounds like it. It's an obligation upon the Muslim husband, for example, to make sure that the, uh, his wife knows the laws about that and how to that. So, it's also an obligation upon him to know, make sure that his wife knows the laws concerning menstruation and what to do concerning menstruation uh, with respect to the bath and with respect to praying. Uh, if his wife, for example, gets bleeding in between the, uh, the periods, he has to make sure that his wife knows what to do work concerning that and so forth. This is all an obligation upon the husband to make sure that his wife has, for example, the proper knowledge of Athena, the proper knowledge of Tuk, those things that she has to do. He should also make sure, and this is a, this is a double-edged sword, sword here, he should make sure that she knows her obligations as a wife, but at the same time, she should, he should make sure that he, she knows her rights as a wife. Cool. Well, how important, uh, how important is this obligation of getting this kind of knowledge? It's so important that scholars like, uh, I'm probably a famous scholar from uh, my home country, Spain. You'll notice in my lectures I quote a lot of scholars from Spain for some reason. I'm probably says this obligation is so important that if the wife does not get this knowledge from her husband, she has the right to leave the house without his permission to get this knowledge. In other words, that the only way she can get this knowledge is by going, for example, to the mosque to listen to a lecture or something then she has the right to leave her house without the husband's permission uh, to get that knowledge. <laughs> yes, to the front end. But the end, no limit. But this is, but this is only in the world because if he's not coming home to make any attempt to see. Yeah, if he, doesn't, if, he, if, he, if he doesn't give her that knowledge, then she has the right to go out and get it. Now, obviously, if she can get that knowledge through books and she doesn't have to go out, then she can get it through, through books. Now, now, in the United States, we have an interesting uh, situation. As one brother, uh, somehow we got into a discussion about the point with the one brother in a city not too far from here. He said that, he said that uh, concerning uh, going to the mosque for prayer, there's a hadith of the Prophet that says that you should not prevent your wife. If your wife has permission to go to the mosque, you should not prevent your wife from going to the mosque. That's the heading of the, of the program. That's the heading of the Muslim heading. But that's in all obligations and all uh, laws and Islam. Now, certain things also have to be considered. Unfortunately, especially for many uh, Americans who, who perhaps do not have any background in Muslim and, and the principles of Islam and how Islam works, they just take the hadith by itself, and if anyone goes against that hadith in any way, even if it's a Sharia uh, acceptable way, then of course they will, they will say that that person is going in the hadith and from Ahmed and so on. So one brother he gave me an example. He said in his city, his wife, in the mosque is saying they prayed in before, now things have gotten better. He said his wife used to attend the Jum'ah. Or his wife used to insist on attending the Jum'ah, the Friday prayer, to listen to the Khutbah. But he himself knew that the stuff that was being said by the Imam the Khutbah was not correct. It was not knowledge, it was unknowledge. It was called bad knowledge, right? It was called unknowledge today. So in this kind of situation, if the wife goes to the mosque, See, preventing your wife from going to the mosque depends on whether that prevention is based on Sharia principle or not. 
So for example, if your wife asks for permission to go to the mosque, and you say no simply because you don't want her to go to the mosque, okay, you have done wrong. You have disobeyed the hadith of the Prophet. But if you tell your wife not to go to the mosque because of an overriding principle in the Sharia, then this is your ishtihad and you have the right to make that ishtihad. So for example, if there's lots of fitna in the mosque, if men and women are mixing, for example, and unfortunately in, uh, in some Muslim countries, during Salat of Sarawih, during the night prayer and the, and the, uh, during the month of Ramadan, in some Muslim countries, the women, they go to the night prayer, they go to Salat of Sarawih, and they go wearing lots of makeup and zina and so forth. And after the prayer, many some of the men go to the women and they mix. So with a situation like that where there's something or something wrong involved and you tell your wife that you cannot go because of that shayu of well then you have the right to prevent your wife in the situation. Now how did I get to that point? Oh, about yeah, going to the mosque for the sake of, uh, of, of knowledge. Uh, if, if the brother feels, for example, and he has some knowledge and he knows that if the woman goes to the mosque, she will not get knowledge, and unfortunately that's the case in some mosques throughout the United States, she will get the, uh, what they refer to as unknowledge, then he has the right to, to prevent her time. That's your question. Good question. Uh, you said that the uh, scholar made the statement that uh, if the husband is not fulfilling his duties in regards to bringing the knowledge to her, she has the ability to go outside of the home to get the knowledge. If that's the only way to the knowledge. Now, in, in, uh, in order to get the knowledge, uh, like you say, in Philadelphia, it's not all our places that are available. And some of the places that are available, you have to pay for them. So then if the sister doesn't have money of her own to pay for them, can she take money from her husband secretly to pay for that class to keep them out? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, will, uh, I will answer that question based on my understanding of the uh, seven principles. This, this is the obligation of, uh, of the husband to maintain his wife physically, economically, and also with respect to his transference. So, for example, the woman he's not giving her food. So then she has the right to take the money from him, you know, steal the money, so to speak, from him, and spend it on food. So similarly, she should have the same right to the same kind of thing. Okay, and she, uh, say if there's nothing available close by and that she has to go abroad to get this out, say she has to go out of state to get it, she still do this? Probably, I mean, she should probably stay within the limits of, uh, of travel. I mean, she shouldn't get travel because then you're talking about another prohibition. Not just leaving the house without permission, but then there's a prohibition of, of, of uh, travel. But I think nowadays, inshallah, the situation should never be that bad. Because there's always both of them. There's things available, there's other things available. So inshallah, it's not a situation where, inshallah, she'd have to travel, for example, to New York to get no, I'm sure. Any, uh, any other questions? Excuse me, so as long as she has books in the house, then, um, then you know, the wife has a book, then there is no need for going anywhere. Yeah. So you said okay, no, we're distinguishing now between the two things. One is the situation where she's not getting the knowledge, the knowledge isn't available to her. Yeah. And I was stressing how important it is for her to get knowledge. By saying, as a court of being actually other scholars said, uh, that the knowledge is so important that if she can't get it, then she has the right to leave the house without her husband's permission. Now, the situation where she can get that knowledge within her house through books or through other means, or a situation where uh, he will allow her to go, for example, to some country and, and to get that knowledge. Then in that case, she doesn't have the right to also to, to, to leave the house without her permission. In other words, if no one is available to her, if he's seeking her or if she has available to her, she doesn't have the right to, uh, to leave the house without her permission. So we're talking specifically about leaving the house without her permission. If there's a lecture like this, for example, and he gets her permission, then this is one of the ways, inshallah, that he can uh, provide her with that knowledge that, uh, that she needs. <laughs> And the next, uh, the next right. 
there's a right of, uh, I'd like to talk about in a, in a collision situation. I guess we'll, uh, I should mention this. That, that's the right of, uh, of equal treatment. And a polygamous uh, situation, she has the right of being treated equal. Now, being treated equal applies to what? Equal in what sense? Equal in the sense that uh, she's giving, that uh, considerably will tell us to buy another wife's a watch and it costs a so much amount of money that uh, he should buy the other one with the same thing of uh, equal value that he should support them both equally, he feed them equally, store them equally. Uh, in regards to loving them equally, uh, I've heard two different things. Uh, one thing I've heard, I've heard one uh, group of individuals say that he supposed to love them equally, but I uh, follow the opinion of another group of individuals who say that uh, loving them equally is unnecessary because a man has no control over his heart, over his heart. And it's possible that they have been with one wife longer than another. It's also possible that one wife is performing the duties uh, of a wife and following, uh, adhering towards the Quran and Sunnah, more than the other one. Of course, if one is adhering towards the Quran and Sunnah than the other, then more than likely he's going to love the one more who's adhering to the Quran and Sunnah than the other. Excellent. Now, what is to with respect to treating the white people? Obviously, this is within the limits of reason. And what it means by, by that is that he should not show uh, his wife, any one of his wives that she is preferring. He should not, he should not allow them to feel that he is preferring another one of his wives financially and so forth. So it's not, it's not for example, the, the, the kind of situation where if he buys, for example, a wife for $10 for one, for one wife, then that means he has to go out buy a watch for ten dollars for his other wife. If he can't find one for ten, he has to buy one for eleven dollars. So he owes his other wife one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> it is just in the sense where he doesn't show that he is favoring any one of them, and that when it comes to, for example, housing and uh, who he sits with, you know, on a regular basis, and this kind of thing, that he doesn't show any for any uh, any preference. So on those things which are clearly and openly Hope it's easy to see. He should not show any any preference among any of the wives. Well, if he, do, if he does so, as the Prophet as said, said that if he does so, then on the day of judgment he will come, and one half he will come with one half of his side, one other half of his body uh, hanging or hanging. Yes. yes. Even we were talking about the, the sister is living a certain, being the couple who living a certain way. And he wants to get in this religion situation, so he takes from her. I'm saying, so it shouldn't be to get, to get in that situation, so he's taking away from his first wife and, you know, taking her down from where she's used to living. So shouldn't maybe he should just get another job or something? You know what I'm saying? Bring them both up there? Well, don't get another job. He's not going to have time for another wife. <laughs> Okay, let's, uh, let's make it clear. Yeah, suppose, for example, he's, he's let's say, middle class, leaving the poor class, I'm not going back to the middle class. Suppose he's, he's middle class. Now, middle class, there's some range from what, you know, middle class, what the wife should have for them. Let's say, like, middle class, you'll get, let's say, like, from uh, three to ten dresses. How does that sound? Sounds great. She's making them. She's making material. She makes them. Okay. And I assume you pay her for making them. So, you know, we're in a middle class woman that they get three to ten dresses. And a brother is giving his wife ten dresses. They're middle class. Now he's thinking of getting a second wife. If he gets a second wife, that wife is going to go from, for example, 10 dresses to 7 dresses. 5 dresses. She's really mathematically inclined, you'll figure that out. But it, she's going to go from 10 dresses to 5 dresses. Now she has the right to know about. She has the right to mean according to the situation of her, of her, her situation is that. What was happening was that before the brother was giving her more than the minimum. And now he's willing, he's going to give her 
less than what you do, but still more than than uh, still more than the minimum. No, you're not going down to three dozen. He's going down to five dozen. Now the question is, is he still providing for her? The answer is yes. He still he's still providing for her according to what is worth. Perhaps you could argue that he was wrong in giving her more in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> no, as long as he stayed within the general, uh, like middle class, for example, it wasn't a big, big, big jump. Well, they extend it too. It wasn't from 10 to the next. Yeah, okay. as long as it's a, if you, for example, consider middle class, if they'll have like from three to 10 dresses, as long as it's staying within what's the third right to the next situation. Well, when we give her a name, we suppose to support her not only based upon his means, but uh, if he, say, in this is a little cat situation, so where her brother was giving her a 10, but the sister has no need for 10 dresses. I mean, there's only seven days in a week anyway, and, you know, more likely she's going to go wearing four or five of them anyhow. You know, if you're not very custodial. <laughs> so he looked at it from a week point of view, they looked at it from a year point of view, there's only 365 days in a year. Well, they don't know if you're going to get a no, as, as I said, it's not. It's a matter of does he stay within the limits of his situation. Also, uh, you said that um, that the husband can't give, me, that he can't show preference. Uh, I'm, I'm supposing that also he shouldn't have any preference over uh, over one life, over one life over another, and that's you know this one is adhering more to Christ than the other. But uh, you said he should not show more preference to one way uh, than to and, another. And these things that you can, when you say showing preference, in other words, you mean like saying, well, you know, I really don't like being bothered her right now. As a matter of fact, I think I only like her one day a week and I like her four days a week or whatever. I mean, this is something that you're saying they can't do. No, absolutely not. Okay. I just wanted to clarify preference because, you know, sometimes I think this works to you a little. Mm. And as, as the brother mentioned earlier, the, uh, the the equality deals with these physical things that he can control and does not deal with, for example, the loving uh, card for certain wives. This is something that, uh, that he cannot control. There's an ace in public system in which the public system was making God, saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is my division over things I can control, do not hold me accountable for uh, the division of things I cannot control. And even among the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of them actually was more beloved to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than the other wife. The other wife knew it. But in these things that he could control, he did not. Uh, he did not uh, show any favor to the Lord Aisha, perfect to the other woman. Oh, by the way, that I eat before some of the brothers might try to attack me on it. I'm back to it as we, but I know we showed it to be heaven, and I think I know the feminist uh, correct. Did you mention the hadith where the Prophet mentioned I should be favored to them? I forget it was a, a, a sweet fruit or. Something like that. As if you know, he made a parable among his wives. Uh, I think they're talking about the superiority of Aisha, the dead woman. This is not talking about what we're talking about here. This is talking about with respect to her dean and her admin and so forth. I'm glad that he expressed it. And he, he expressed it in the sense that we have it today as a hadith that he said. Aisha, Aisha is to the other one as this is to this. Oh. Yeah, but that's just showing her superiority with respect to Dean and so forth. It wasn't him showing that he likes her more than than, uh, than the others. But as I said, it was well known among the the wives, the prophet's wives, that the uh, Aisha was the, the the prophet's favorite. Uh, but he did not show any favoritism. Uh, I mean. Have we ever, have we, uh, how many rides have we gotten so far, by the way? Can anyone keep your track? Seven? The next, the next ride, 
I don't know if you for women will call this right thing, but it has the has included in the rank. The next right is with respect to this is the, the right the, the woman has the right to be treated in a certain way when we can say the, the marriage is uh, crumbling or not working out. When the when the woman is being disobedient to the husband, this is called the truth. When the woman is being disobedient to the husband, she has the right, even in that in that case, to be treated with in the proper manner. And what's the what's the proper manner? There are three steps that you should take towards your wife. Uh, if she is being uh, recalcitrant or she is being disobedient. And what they mean, by the way, by disobedient is she is showing, and the shoes, what the shoes means is she is showing a general attitude not to accept her husband as the head of the house, not to accept him. The three steps to be taken are what? Okay. <laughs> uh, they are admonishment, and uh, that will be verbal. Not.